Now I would like to uh, give a big hand for Robert Rylander from Victoria Swedish ICT and Jens Olof Lind from Saab Kockums. Welcome up on stage, guys. Uh, give them a, a welcome. Marcus, before we let those guys uh, start up, what, to, uh, what are your expectations or what are you thinking of? I'm thinking of uh, the importance of uh, the word. The first word in, in your presentations is auto autonomous which is something that is really growing at the moment, from autonomous uh, things in the air, on the sea surface and below the sea surface as well. And um, there's a lot of uh, things going on. You probably will uh, share some of it with us. And uh, some questions that I, I would raise. Would, uh, can, can you really rely on the performance of these vehicles and what they produce? Um, what about the legal framework for supporting the uh, the use of such vehicles? I'm thinking mostly above uh, above the in, in the uh, in the air, mm. which has been uh, dealt with for several years now without getting uh, the, the proper pace. You will probably touch upon this too, and also the security part of uh, the information provided. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to see your combined views on these subjects, if you are going to touch upon them at all. Thank you. There you, there you got a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> that yes, was set um, the framework. But please, I'll leave the stage for you now, and uh, autonomous shipping on the horizon. OK. <clears throat> so I have um, cut this one down to what's going on, and uh, why is it happening. It's, it's kind of interlinking to what Tobias is said earlier, so it's, uh, he's really set the level high for me. Um, and then Jens is going to follow up on more what is happening in, in the, on the naval uh, surface domain at the moment, and uh, in a Saab perspective. So I'm from Victoria, which is a um, part of the Swedish uh, research in a way, um, research institutes. So we are a broad family, and we're going to be even broader after um, uh, New Year. But so Victoria, if you Google Victoria, Swedish ICT after uh, 2017, you will probably be end up at a page that is called uh, Rise R R R I dot S E. So and there's another bunch of uh, research. Uh, people and we are kind of in the middle of uh, the academics and the industry. So we are in the middle part, in the gap. So what is uh, an autonomous or we would like to call it a remote operated vessel? Uh, this is a system picture from a uh, large product that is ended, Moonin. So we have the vessel, we have some sensor input, we're going to have some kind of uh, control. We have maybe a manned or an unmanned bridge, or a partially unmanned. And we're going to have all these sensors in the infrastructure of the vessels. All this is going to be kind of connected. What is going on in the other domains? So, uh, why, uh, and the, as Tobias said, what are we doing? Even in the, uh, the maritime sector, it's been very, very conservative. But we are starting to do the go from analog to digital. When I was a cadet at sea, uh, the captain at noon, uplink, satellite link, I had 500 uh, characters to send a message home to mom, all well, on my way to Japan, see you in March. That was about six months ahead. Uh, so, and now we are doing this, and we are doing this in parallel. So it's very interesting change, the last, 10 years. When I was outside Angola, working at 800 meters with two ROVs at uh, the bottom, 280 bars pressure, uh, testing a pipeline, I could call home to my wife from my cabin. So in 10 years, it's changed a lot. And this, of course, is a lot of challenges. What else is going on, except for the digitalization? Big ships, we have uh, even bigger ones in the, in on, the, on the horizon, several projects. Scandinavia is on the market as well. Finland with the Rolls Royce again. Amsterdam, 
visualizing visualizing small pods with um, self-driving um, per, uh, again jam take you from A to B instead of using the big ones. And then we have a big actor that is also on the on the scene, China. So it's it's happening. It's not just on the horizon, but will it be autonomous or will it be um, down manned or or will it be remote operated? Well, it depends on the, how far away you can see on the horizon. So why is it happening? We have done a, a lot of research here. We have uh, optimized the hull. We have optimized the, the, the main engines. We are ter trying alternative fuels. And then suddenly, hey, we can do something new. We can go up another curve instead. Because this one is actually, maybe we could have our core business here. And, but if we don't look at this one, as Tobias said, we will be out of business maybe. So it's time for the shipping industry to take the jump. Okay, if we look at the, the other ones, uh, what is happening in the other fields? Mm, this is Gartner. We can see all these things that are going up the hype curve. And as I said, autonomous vehicles, they are here. I don't see any vessels. Are we left behind? Are we not at hype level at all? Or could we learn from this one and maybe we could bypass some of these people and tag along with the, the car industries? I don't know. So this is the car industry. Short, we went from new technology, we got ABS, we got um, uh, steering capabilities, and then suddenly we went from uh, stabilizing the, the vehicle, we went to driver support, and then we are going here. And yes, you can see it's a quite a narrow time span, 60 years, or even less, we will have maybe autonomous cars and vehicles all over the place. But it's all about these iterations, as Tobias talked about. Can we do the same in the shipping industry? So I made a little map. I tried to put some where is the shipping industry compared to the other ones. And <laughs> sadly, I put it us down here. We are still on, we have some automatic processes on the vessels, but it's mainly semi-automatic. So it's always a human in the loop. And then we have all the other actors. They are over here, maybe. The Navy or the military zone, they are way ahead of us in the shipping industry. And then we have the other civilian. Well, with the mining industry, they are way ahead of us. Civilian aircraft, the only time you really feel that the pilot is flying is when you hit the landing tarmac like that, and you say, oh, that was a bad automatic landing. But that is actually the pilot landing. Because when you feel the smooth one, that's the automatic. In the oil and gas, we have what we call these uh, dynamic positioned vessels. I've been working on one, some of those. And yes, they are, and they have the fundamentals for being remote controlled. They could be easily, quite easily turned over to uh, autonomous processes as well. But they are in their own little domain, but they are, will be moving quite fast this way. So maybe we could use that one to move the shipping industry upwards. So I made a copy of the, my colleagues' uh, slides from the automotive industry. So we, we went from vessel dynamics and stabilization. We got better positioning, we got the DP system, still 50, 100 meters, not good enough for uh, driving, but okay, we could uh, control the vessel. And then we get more and more precise solutions, we got more more high-tech solutions down here, and now we maybe we are here somewhere. Can we bridge the gap? Some ones are doing this already. We maybe we need some new technology, and they are on the horizon. But how will this look like? IMO is one of the key holders for the future. 
Here's another one. We're doing the sea traffic management. Maybe one of the neighbors for uh, traffic management, manned vessel, unmanned vessels in the future. Who knows? So, will it take off? Use case navigation. Uh, this is statistics from um, Alliance and the Lloyd's uh, registers. We still have accidents. We will have accidents in the future. Some go up, some go down. But machinery stands for 50%. And then we have collisions and wrecked and stranded. Maybe they are linked together. I don't know. How will it look for the autonomous? Is it better to remove the human in the loop? Will this one go down? I don't know. Do we put in new risks and hazards into the system? Maybe they will go up. That will not be acceptable. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, we will see. Cargo. Is this going to take off with autonomous? This is DHL, as you see. Look at the vessel. That's how they foresee shipping. It's not an autonomous vessel. But it's, at least it's uplinked. Oh. This is still DHL. This is how they foresee what's coming in the cargo sector in five years, in less or more than five years. Smart vessels. Remote control vessels, anyone? Do you see it? I don't. But maybe we are. Next year, they do this survey all the time. Maybe we will soon pop up on the radar. Again, we have Anwen uh, um, up here. So, automatic uh, robotics. So, maybe we can <laughs> bypass and jump to that point directly. Because if the EHL doesn't see any use with autonomous vessels, who will? So, what can we do? This is from the uh, Finnish initiative. So, they took a bull carrier, Delta Marine, and this was one of the first studies. What can we gain? We remove the superstructure here by removing the people. And we can save some money by construction cost. Maybe we could load this one a little bit more since the weight went away. The air drag, we could optimize the energy consumption here. We don't need the air conditioning and all that stuff. And yeah, something like 7-8% savings. So yeah, it will maybe happen. Doesn't sound much, 7-8%. Um, do we need to do other things? Will we keep on the he heavy fuel oil? Maybe the mooning project said, okay, there's a lot of gain. <laughs> but if you have to switch to have redundancy or um, uh, low maintenance in the engine room, we have to go to the diesel, the cost will go up instead maybe for an autonomous vessel because we're going to have double systems. So mm, who knows? At the moment, um, diesel is quite cheap compared to a couple of years ago. So, but if the oil, oil price goes up again, we will put more efforts into this one. As another project that goes on, if we could load a vessel t uh, 10 more centimeters on the draft uh, from us tankers, and they say let they, they have an earnings of three US dollars per barrel, that would still give us a lot of money on the bottom line. So if we could Downsize the vessel with the, the superstructure, save 7% maybe. We could lo load the vessel a little bit more. Yes, there is um, money on the bottom line for this. So mm, it could be happening. And then this is this one. Environmentals. Will we have less collisions? Will we have more vessels instead of fewer vessels sailing the seas? What will they do? Will they speed up? Will they speed down? Is it the bigger vessels, like uh, the triple E, the Maersk ones, that will be remote control? Or is it even smaller vessels, maybe one container at a time, instead of uh, 12,000? That is the, will be the driving force for this one. 
So, yes, the conclusion that we foresee, if the, the, if the cargo shippers, if they don't see uh, us as a, something vital for their business, who's going to buy an autonomous vessel? Because it's going to cost a lot of money. So we have to be seen on the DHL radar to be um, booming or getting into this market, I think. Social. Fewer personnel on board, of course, we could save money. Uh, then we need a shore center. Maybe we, we will need more people in the shore center, but maybe the wages will be lower or we could work more efficiently. Uh, that's still vague how that will look out. But something will happen. And we have social issues like we have a lot of, or um, at least um, in, in Scandinavian countries, we have uh, quite maybe one fifth, one fourth uh, student is a female. And they are really good students, maybe the best ones. Then they go at sea, they work a little short time at sea, and then they go ashore. So we lose their competence. And then they maybe they end up in the shipping industry on the shore side, which is good. But if you could maybe have a shore center, that maybe would be an attractive place for a more equal society to work in. Instead of the maybe a, a bit rough, manly, unfortunately, traditionally, shipping that I still foresee. So... It could be a social factor that this one is uh, for uh, equal. And again, we can have people in the Scandinavian monitoring the vessel when it sails in the, in the Pacific. And when the vessel uh, sails in the, at night in the Atlantic area, we could turn, switch over to Singapore and they can monitor the vessel. So there's a, there's a lot of these new features that could surface a new... new but we don't know how it will look yet. So I'm soon going to hand over to Jens. But there's a lot of things in this shipping that has to be gone. Go. We have to transform from analog papers into digital formats to, for this one to take off. And it's not just not only on the bridge or in the engine room. It's how we handle uh, bill of ladings. It's how we uh, report areas. Can we do that? And there's a lot of things going on that turning this wheel towards digitalization. And there's a lot of projects in the European Union that maybe we could tap into to make this happen. Because if we don't get this, we will not have autonomous vessels. That's a, or we will have them maybe, but it's going to take a long, long time before we see them at sea. Um, yeah. Jens? So, thank you. Fully aware of the time aspect here. I will give you a fast walkthrough through my pictures, and I won't advise you that all these pictures will be available uh, after this presentation. So, coming up. Yes. So I work at Saab Kockums, which is a company here in Karlskrona, a shipyard. And uh, I am the product manager for unmanned surface vehicles, and I'm also involved in, in research and development things. Saab is pretty much aircraft and stuff. It's um, defense, security, safety aspect oriented products. What we do uh, in Saab is global. There are market areas, and there are some different business areas. Uh, and one of the new things I would like to tell you about today is that from January 1st next year, uh, there will be a new business area called Nautics, which essentially is based on, on the Cockham's uh, product portfolio case. In addition to that, that, there are aircraft, weapons, sensors, communication systems, and some support things. And the things we do at Cockums is in order to support naval operations. Naval operations, military perspective, is the pursuit to maintain shipping to and from the countries we are supporting. 
Homeland Defense, Force Projection. The things we do here is not typically containers, it's about surveillance, reconnaissance, force projection, mine warfare, anti-submarine warfare, stuff like that. In order to go through that, there is a number of different boats, and what we do at Saab is that we can build submarines, we can build surface ships, and we also do maintenance and support. And what you see here, just connecting to previous presentations, is that we have some well-established core competence products. We also have a running R&D program beginning quite a while ago with unmanned surface vehicles. And that program is done here in Karlskrona. This is where we have the shipyard, and this is where we have surface development, and also the test area for unmanned surface vehicles. This is just adjacent to the Navy base. But there is also people in, in Malmö uh, designing submarines, and we also have a maintenance shipyard in the southern Stockholm archipelago in this Cold War base that is now uh, under land lease for, for Saab. So what we say that we do underwater technology, we do air-independent propulsion systems, we do stealth technology, that is ships that you can't see on radar or can't hear. We do lightweight constructions, mine countermeasure systems, including shock and also the unmanned surface vehicle thing. And just to give you a, a slide pointing this, this one is core technology, where we are right now. This is uh, the A26 submarine that is under construction. So this is the main bulk of what we are doing at Saab at the moment, Saab Kokums. What we also do on the surface side is that we provide mine countermeasure systems. And here it's a matter of fact, already existing mine sweeping system for the surface and underwater mine hunting systems that already have autonomous capabilities and already uh, can be used as standalone unmanned units, more or less connected to uh, surface control units or to the cables or on program being autonomous for under or underwater uh, measurements. And this is part of the SOAP portfolio. SOAP is working on unmanned systems in many different domains. So what we are doing now is that we are trying to mesh together what we have learned in uh, detect and avoidance programs, in air control programs, here, uh, the safety regulations for unmanned maritime systems, these with legal aspects uh, on a European scale, and also standardization of the communication protocols so that different kinds of vehicles can communicate with each other. And uh, that is obviously part of the, of the, what do you say, not the legacy, but we have been seeding these development programs for over 10 years. Uh, there, it's 30 years ago we were began running uh, remote-controlled vehicles. It's 10 years ago we started running unmanned. Sorry, it's 15 years ago we started doing simulations and, and going into computer gaming on different kinds of, of boats that were more or less autonomous, based on um, research at the Blekinge Institute of Technology, social agent networks, and stuff like that. And what we have had since 2006 is, is uh, field demonstrators or sea demonstrators. One of them being this, this minesweeper. The thing is down here, and what you have here is a, a live detonation from a, a mine indicating the scale of the environmental shock that is exposed to. And, and this, for example, is designed to be transportable in a 40-foot container. So. Autonomous shipping in this case means that we can build one of these or several of these minesweepers, put them into 40-foot containers and transport them anywhere to establish a minesweeping capability within very shortly. We also have this system here, that is the Piraya. We have four of these, they are very small, four meter long, but they provide complexity for developing control methodology, human operator interfaces and, and operational concepts. On a, relatively safe manner. And we also have this, and at least we had it. It's a six meter target boat that was developed last year and, and that is not with us anymore. It was used for, for target practicing purposes with the Swedish Navy. So the problems we have here are not technical, but legal, most of all. Uh, how can we arrange so that it will be allowed to use unmanned systems at sea in conjunction with existing regulations? How can we arrange with 
uh, the operator understanding the benefits and the possible drawbacks of using unmanned systems. How can we come up with requirements and criteria for validation and verification of these systems on a quantitative level? And most of the unmannedness, autonomous stuff that's done now is <coughs> almost purely qualitative. What we try to do when we focus on unmanned systems is try to not look on the end user behavior or this engineering part, which is, which is shipbuilding, but we're trying to understand men and machines together in the terms of joint cognitive systems, where people and software are communicating with each other through a cable or perhaps over a network. The thing here is that all communication takes time. You have some environment, you have some sensing system, you have some data transmission. And what we experience is that how you define your world model, how, you, how much data you have to send over with which bandwidth, over which kind of network topology, has huge impact on the controllability of your system and of the safety of your system. And to get quantitative in these matters, we have applied this model, which is kind of getting some recognition now where we say that if these are people and these are onboard programs, the communication goes back and forth. And what we realize is that at some level, we will have to allow the software to be authorized to run by itself. So the quantitative question here is how do we define the communication requirements and under which we quantitatively can arrange and allow for the onboard software to run by itself. So what we're looking at here is, well, first of all, having one boat go on an autopilot route. That's pretty much neat. We have dynamic positioning systems or dynamic dynamic positioning systems because what we do is that we run with, with running targets, so to speak. We look into swarming concepts and we do look into mission level operations. And um, uh, this is interesting because this allows for the introduction of dynamic obstacles, which means that used based on swarming concepts, we identify a very scalable architecture for handling other boats that are running around in the area. For example, recognized on AIS systems and or on other means by optical sensors on board radars. So we think that while these are stovepiped, uh, going into swarming systems will allow us to, to upgrade so the number of units at the same time. So rolling up, uh, there are a number of more or less sub-supported national initiatives that, that are, are taking place right now. Uh, a couple of years ago, Saab and the Swedish Defense Material Administration, together with the Royal Institute in Stockholm, established what's called the Center for Underwater Technology, CUTE supported by uh, CEO of Saab. And one of the initiatives is to develop a national research industrial agenda for underwater systems. So this paper is out there, and that link you can see on the left-hand side can be used for downloading this paper also in an English version. And essentially all these uh, actors from authorities, universities and industry have participated in developing this this agenda. So we have some defense-oriented, security-oriented organizations. We have Blakingen Institute of Technology. We have ABB, Saab, obviously, some other people. Calitara is local here, uh, that uh, are supporting this national ini initiative. And based on this also, um, there is now an application pending. We are on the short list for one of nine remaining uh, applications now for the SMARC, the Swedish Maritime Robotics Center, which if allowed, if, if um, being um, given the money, would be a seven-year program on a total of, uh, I think, 30 million Swedish crowns a year. Looking at production, uh, societal safety and environmental monitoring uh, at sea for, for national or, or uh, Baltic purposes. And we also have this program, which is purely into autonomy, spanning all different sectors, air, ground and sea, which is a 10-year program funded by the Wallenberg Foundation, aiming at procuring or promoting Swedish uh, understanding and knowledge in development of autonomy on the broad scale. So this is, uh, one, in total, it's a 1.8 billion Swedish crown program over a 10-year period. 
aiming at recruiting professors and also actually promoting 100 industrial PhD students over three different PhD classes, the first one running as we speak. So these are some of the things we do already. Test benches, surface targets, underwater surveillance stuff. This is some of the things we're looking forward to. Submarine. And, and I would like to highlight this thing in front here, the, the forward payload bay, which is quite big, which allows for underwater equipment being uh, put out and put in. And we're also looking into, for example, this kind of, in this case, a 12-meter design for underwater warfare support, including surveillance systems and, and or, or targeting systems. Thank you very much. Very good. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, while you're thinking of a, a smart question to put up here to the guys, uh, Marcus, did you have any reflections from this? Yeah, I immediately came across to a discussion I had with a friend of mine who is a captain of a large uh, container ship. In, uh, he runs across the Baltic to and from. And I introduced the idea of in the future being a, a new system called Auto Captain. But he didn't like that. He thought it was enough with an autopilot. But uh, I know why he thought that. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for a very good presentation. And uh, obviously, there is. Apart from the technology part, there is a large cultural uh, thing to be handled between different sectors and uh, uh, dual use or multiple use uh, capabilities uh, between military and civilian applications, as we have seen example for today. And it's actually, in, in my view, it's not actually the capabilities. They could be that there are different civilian capabilities and military capabilities, but the technology could be shared. And how how, how about that? Is that on, on a growing scale, or is it uh, still uh, not movable, so to say? Or what 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 is happening with the dual or multiple use of technologies in this field? Who is? <coughs> yeah. Well. Um, we were on a conference, uh, me, Jens, and one of the answers is, is sharing is why I'm standing here together with Jens, because we are working together to share this into the uh, civilian domain. Uh, but we were in a conference in Amsterdam this summer, and most of the projects are going on, that are going on over the world, from Singapore, China, and then have started in the military domain, and then are scaling up, as they say, into the civilian more and more. So yeah, it's, it's a transfusion or transfer of knowledge, yes. I would say. And uh, I agree with you. And I would say that uh, the civilian sector and the military comes from two different ways in here. The civilian in order to get benefit from the techno technological development. But on the technology side or sub side, it's actually mostly a matter of being accepted as, as operators in the common environment, which is currently uh, unclear from a legal perspective, and, and um, we also want to participate in, in developing operational concepts together with military users and, and civilian ones. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a question uh, from uh, Mr. Robert in the back. Thank you, Markus. Uh, Robert Bursevich from Automatica Poland. Uh, this is a very interesting topic, and we are both fit inside it because from one side our company is doing all this kind of HVAC and piping systems, which are to facilitate men on board ships. And from the other side, we are developing uh, automatic systems, robotics. So we are also aiming the, the other curve that was mentioned. So we are already thinking about the future and our future products and services. But uh, all that we spoke to, uh, as per now is leading us straight toward matrix. Yeah, because at some point we are meeting this singularity point, which was mentioned before when the machine will outsmart us. So uh, my question is, because all these initiatives will success, this is for sure, this is the only matter of question of why. And when, not why, when. But is there anybody, any kind of uh, authority that is uh, asking the question, how can we control it, or are we even able to put it into reality without threat? I don't know, IMO or some other bodies do ask that question. I'll take that one. And I assume you're not speaking of controlling the matrix, but controlling shipping in this case. And, and there was a conference last week on um, international maritime law and unmanned systems. 
Uh, IMO will be addressed to the next Maritime Safety Council in 98 in, in May 2017. And uh, we are gathering some kind of a consensus group now. Uh, in Sweden, its representation is the Transportation Authority and uh, its European Defence Administration, it's the, the British Association, and we also have the Americans uh, represented by industry and, um, and um, the Coast Guard that has to speak. In addition to that, there are also the South Koreans and the Chinese in the same conference uh, opening up to this question. So, yes, it's now well accepted in, in the IMO domain of things that unmanned systems are here. And the question is how, under what circumstances, do we have to, to adjust the instruments, legal instruments that IMO is, is, is working on? And the baseline here actually is the kind of definitions that I indicated here to agree upon how to describe autonomy, how to describe unmannedness, first of all, before we go into doing any kind of legal... Uh, legal um, uh, work, but we we have contact with that, and the work is on an international level recognized and, and starting. Thank you for your question.